Okay, um, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to my today's webinar uh, about Game of Thrones and art that we can observe in this series. Uh, first of all, I would like to inform you about some uh, practical as theoretical and practical aspects uh, of uh, this webinar. Uh, this event is organized as a part of the project Welcome to TEU, uh, and it, the project was financed by the Polish National Agency for Academic Exchange, and it's a part of the project Welcome to Poland. Um, well, my webinar is one of several uh, events organized by the university. Uh, of course, uh, each one was in English. Uh, my today's topic is uh, Game of Thrones. I think there's hardly anyone who doesn't know this series. Uh, and for me as an art historian, it's especially interesting. Uh, I work at TU, Tishnew European University, and uh, I'm have a lot of classes for students uh, who just begin their uh, studies, especially uh, graphic design studies. Uh, and uh, the connections between pop culture and so-called higher culture, a serious one, uh, is one of the most important topics of um, uh, my uh, research. And I wanted to talk more about uh, some uh, specific aspects of the use of uh, art in Game of Thrones. Uh, if there were any questions, I forgot to mention it, uh, don't hesitate to ask me, I'll try to answer. Uh, Yes, as I have mentioned today, I would like to concentrate on, on some specific aspects of the use of uh, art in Game of Thrones, especially ones that were uh, interesting uh, for not only specialists, but uh, they show the way art can be used in series, uh, not only as a background or something that makes a, a series or movie more attractive, but as a way to uh, say something more about uh, the character, the society, uh, or some uh, historical uh, uh, references. Uh, yes, I hope it's going to work. Uh, I'm just sharing my uh, screen because uh, I prepared so many illustrations for today uh, that uh, any other program couldn't handle it. Uh, I'd like to begin with um, two photos from uh, last series. Uh, I'll try to avoid any spoilers uh, and not mention any details that could ruin uh, the series for people who didn't, uh, who haven't seen it uh, yet. Uh, these photos were published as um, um, some kind of uh, promotion of the last series and they gained a lot of attraction of viewers and not only them uh, because they depicted uh, Sansa one of the leading characters wearing some kind of leather armor that looks uh, like a combination of an armor and um, uh, some kind of uh, uh, elegant gown and um, it uh, drew attention because uh, so armor it wouldn't work uh, it seemed like seemed like a reference to some um i don't know maybe um underwear or a costume that wouldn't be able to protect her in real battle uh, so it raised a discussion about the function of this uh, element of um, her dress uh, and whether it was um, a reference to her role in the last series or maybe just something uh, also, also, uh, this photo published uh, a dress that Sansa wore in the very final uh, episode of the series uh, and it was broadly discussed because of many tiny details that uh, uh, were somehow connected to uh, her role in the series and um, previous events we can notice here a wolf that was um, in the coat of arms of uh, the family, and also some uh, tiny details that looks uh, that look a bit like uh, the elements of the holy tree that was um, uh, uh, very important for the events and um, for the family. And of course, uh, 
the uh, leaves that look a bit like uh, red leaves of this saint uh, tree, but also have are somehow connected to the winter that is coming and changing the color of uh, the leaves uh, on the trees. Uh, and again, we can observe here a reference to armor, uh, not a very practical one, but uh, very well looking. Uh, what's interesting, we can observe armor elements also in the dresses of uh, Cersei Lannister, uh, one more extremely important character in the series. Uh, they were broadly discussed as, um, as you can notice, they don't look like they could protect her in any way. Uh, some viewers and um, books fans uh, noticed that they look a bit like uh, some kind of corset armor used in um, video games, uh, which are considered a bit absurd uh, by uh, players, viewers, uh, because the uh, main goal is not to protect uh, women's body, uh, but to make her look more attractive. It's more like a metal underwear, uh, part of costume and not real armor. Uh, it was considered a kind of mistake made by uh, the creators of costumes. Uh, that forced uh, one of the leading characters to wear something so useless. Uh, not very comfortable and without any uh, serious function. Uh, we can observe Cersei wearing this kind of uh, armor-like uh, uh, elements of her uh, dress multiple times. It's usually in those episodes in which she's uh, somehow engaged in uh, a battle uh, or some other similar um, events, it suggests that it might have some um, deeper uh, meaning. It's not only an element of a, a dress, but something a bit more. Uh, we can observe even more uh, such elements uh, in the final seasons. Uh, Cersei, uh, the changes in her character, in her role in the series, is depicted through her uh, dresses. In the first series, she's wearing uh, very elegant dresses with long sleeves. Her uh, hair is long, she wears beautiful jewelry, and she exposes her uh, femininity uh, in a very direct way. She, um, uh, those dresses are elegant, made of very rich uh, uh, materials. In the final seasons, she's covering her body almost completely. Uh, she has uh, shorter hair. Uh, all the people who watched the series know why um, her hair changed so drastically. Uh, but the change in uh, the way she's dressed has some deeper meaning. In the first series, she's just uh, a wife of a king. She's a queen. She's a queen mother. She's um, uh, protecting her family, but she uses her beauty and femininity to uh, reach her goals, to achieve what she wants, uh, to uh, raise her power uh, in a very subtle way. In final seasons, she's the ruler, ruler herself. She doesn't need to um, pretend she's just a, a minor character. She actually uh, raised her power uh, and she's the ruler of uh, seven kingdoms uh, that's why her style changed so drastically uh, it's a combination of feminine and masculine uh, elements the masculine ones are uh, especially ones derived from uh, armor feminine ones are of course beautiful dresses but they are not as stereotypically feminine as the previous ones she wants to present herself as a person who is strong and whose power is not derived uh, from her beauty, but it's something more um, general. Uh, she doesn't pretend to be anyone else than just a ruler of seven kingdoms. Some of the elements um, are a very direct reference to specific kinds of armor. The one that we can observe now looks from a big distance like a kind of chain mail uh, made of uh, small uh, pieces of metal uh, combined together. This kind of armor was very popular uh, since uh, 
ancient times. Uh, it was more comfortable than the plate armor because uh, it was much easier to move uh, with it. Uh, and it was a bit lighter. It was an expensive type of armor, but a very popular one. Uh, this dress that you can see um, has a layer that looks like it was made of metal, of this little chain uh, mail uh, derived uh, uh, elements. Uh, and it, this part at the, on the back looks a bit like um, it was an additional spine that protects her from the back. Uh, in the last seasons, we can also see that uh, there are much more elements that are a reference to the coat of arms of the Lannisters family. Uh, that is a lion. Uh, this way, uh, Cersei uh, shows to uh, uh, all the people that she's not only the ruler of the Seven Kingdoms, but also uh, a member of the Lannisters family uh, and a bearer of its traditions. Some other uh, dresses that she wore in this season uh, were also black. Uh, it's a reference to the fact that she... Oops, spoiler alert. It's a reference to uh, many deaths in her family you know, that caused her uh, pain and suffering, and uh, but also a, a reference to a masculine, uh, very modest uh, dresses worn by men. Uh, it can also be a reference to a specific kind of armor made of um, leather. Uh, this time, in this case, a crocodile's leather. And it's uh, uh, one uh, that survives from uh, Roman times, ancient uh, armor. Uh, we know that ones like this were used not as an ordinary protection on the uh, battlefield, but as a kind of... Uh, a parade armor. I will talk about this kind of parade armors later. Uh, but it's clearly um, a reference to specific kind of armor and uh, uh, a way to um, um, show that she's uh, not only a woman, but also a ruler. Uh, another dress that we can observe here on the left is a very, very direct reference to uh, a costume worn by her father. Uh, this father the situation was very important for uh, Game of Thrones, uh, uh, not only the series, but also in the books, uh, because Cersei was for a long time treated by uh, her father uh, as a beautiful girl, not a future potential ruler. Uh, she tried to prove um, uh, her talents for a very long time. Uh, and when she finally uh, became not a mother, uh, daughter, or wife of a ruler, but a ruler herself, uh, she uh, started wearing uh, a beautiful dress uh, with small holes uh, that looks very similarly to the one that uh, her father used to wear. Uh, it was a um, very direct reference to those Father daughter issues and um, also a way to prove that she's a regular ruler uh, at the moment. Uh, similar references can be observed in the dresses that uh, Sansa uh, wore in the last series. Uh, for many viewers, this beautiful dark uh, black dress is a reference to the one uh, to the um, armor worn by her uh, uncle um, his nickname was blackfish and uh, this uh, blackfish is depicted on uh, uh, his breastplate uh, and that's why uh, also his armor looks like um, uh, this fish uh, skin and uh, we can observe something very similar in uh, Sansa's dress. Uh, it also looks like bird's feather because it's uh, very dark, very shiny, uh, black with this delicate blue uh, shade uh, visible when it's shining. Uh, that's the, another way to uh, depict a woman not only as a beautiful feminine um, 
character, but also as a strong ruler. Uh, in fact, we can observe the same change in the costumes of Sansa as we could see uh, watching uh, Cersei throughout the series. Uh, she also began uh, as a lovely young girl uh, wearing delicate pastel dresses and uh, precisely uh, uh, decorated uh, costumes. Uh, later, we can observe her using her um, uh, charm to uh, reach her goals. Then uh, we can see her as a character who uh, completely could completely change her behavior, uh, her way of uh, her style and everything. And we can observe those changes also looking at her dresses uh, that uh, are similar to ones worn by Cersei. At first, very feminine, uh, very elegant ones. In the last series, more practical ones, but also depicting her as a strong woman who doesn't need to use her uh, beauty and body to achieve her goals. Uh, in some uh, other dresses, we can also see some uh, reference to uh, some elements of uh, uh, costumes worn by soldiers. Uh, of course, we can't see uh, such um, jackets uh, in Game of Thrones, so I chose uh, um, a picture from a completely different movie, but with the same actor uh, uh, who played uh, her father in the series. Mm. Of course, uh, the reference is very subtle. You can see uh, those parallel uh, cuts, I guess. I think it's made of a kind of fur and uh, it's only decoration, but it's clear reference to popular European jackets worn by soldiers uh, in 19th and 20th century. And it's still um kind of uh, uh, style used in um, regular jackets that are to be some kind of reference to the um, soldiers' uh, uh, jackets. Um, I have mentioned that uh, those um, jackets and uh, elements of dresses that look a bit similar to armor raised a discussion about uh, the feminine armor in general. Mm, they were uh, seen as something similar to those uh, fake armors worn by uh, women in uh, video games. And uh, sometimes you can observe something like this in uh, illustration, especially uh, some fantasy-like ones. And so it raised a discussion about uh, the absurd uh, feminine armor in general. But uh, observing other uh, characters of Game of Thrones, especially uh, women, we can notice that uh, the ones that actually fought in uh, battles and needed some kind of body protection uh, had armor that looked exactly like masculine one. Uh, it gave protection, it was made of metal, it covered all, all the crucial body parts, uh, and in fact it didn't differ uh, from the masculine one. Uh, it was a strong argument uh, for the theory that uh, uh, those armor-like elements that we can see in Cersei's dresses were not a mistake, but some kind of um, demonstration, some kind of um, uh, an important element of their um, character and its image. Uh, we can see such armor here or, for example, here. This one is not perfect and it doesn't seem to be um, useful, especially because of one element. So you can see that this uh, breastplate uh, is adjusted to the uh, typically feminine uh, body shape. Uh, it's adjusted to cover breast and uh, to expose them somehow. Uh, it's, it looks great. It looks uh, also a bit like uh, the armor that we can see in uh, movies or video games, but it wouldn't be very practical um, because a typical 
breastplate uh, was usually uh, looked just the opposite because uh, its main goal was to protect the body um, from uh, knives, swords and uh, other types of weapon. Uh, to uh, achieve this goal, it needed to uh, not only protect the body, but um, uh, uh, help the weapon miss the crucial spots of the body. If you uh, imagine uh, 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 someone attacking uh, uh, a knight worn dressed like this, uh, you can think that if he was attacked from the in the very central part of the body, uh, the sword would uh, easily move towards the uh, back and towards the um, sides uh, because of the shape of the central part and of the breastplate. Uh, if you make it concave, uh, it helps uh, the attacker to with killing the character because uh, in the very um, crucial part of the arm, uh, the, the plate, it's concave, so uh, it's, it, it's potentially uh, the attack would be much more harmful than in case of the typical um, uh, breastplate. Moreover, uh, there is one more uh, argument uh, against this kind of feminine armor. Uh, if you, uh, if she was, for example, attacked by a knight who wanted to kill her by with a very heavy sword, uh, that could potentially cause uh, some kind of damage of her breastplate. Uh, if such a breastplate um, was damaged slightly, uh, the knight still had uh, about 15 centimeters between his body and the armor. Here, the distance is zero to five centimeters. So uh, even if uh, this breastplate survived the attack uh, and was just slightly damaged, uh, it could damage the body itself. So this one doesn't make any sense, but at least it covers the whole body, so it could be much worse. Uh, when searching for a potential answer on the question what those feminine corset-like uh, breastplates uh, were, uh, I thought about some uh, examples that are uh, in some European museums, especially in Great Britain, and there are some that are kept in American ones. Uh, those are metal corsets that um, uh, are a bit mysterious because some of them uh, look, have a shape that is similar to the ones that actually were actually worn by women. And some of them look like um, they were used for torturing uh, innocent uh, younger girls because their shape is uh, so strange and um, um, so f distant from natural body shape of uh, average woman, like this one that we can see on the right. Uh, some of them seem to be actually used by um, uh, women, like this one on the left that is uh, made of steel and, um, and some, some parts are covered with uh, leather. And it's a bit damaged, so it suggests that it was actually used. Some others like this one uh, are a bit rusty, but we are not sure whether they were actually worn by uh, women. Uh, the ones that seem to be actually used are uh, probably ones that uh, were used for medical reasons. Uh, for, uh, for example, for women who had some problems with their back, with her spine, and uh, their, mo mo their, their main goal was to um, protect the body and um, reduce some back pain or uh, make the silhouette more straight uh, in case of some problems with um, back and uh, spine. So they're usually uh, the ones that uh, don't look so attractive, but they seem like they could be actually worn by someone. The others, like this one, uh, elegant, decorated, 
are probably um, not works of art created in 17th or 18th century, uh, but some kind of fakes created in the uh, 19th century. 19th century was um, really fascinated with uh, medieval uh, times, uh, but uh, not the actual uh, Middle Ages, but uh, some romantic vision of those times when people were religious and uh, uh, men were courageous and women were beautiful. It's a myth of uh, Middle Ages popular also in, for example, movies, uh, video games or a series. So um, probably they were just created uh, as fake examples of um, a medieval uh, vision of femininity uh, as something that uh, on the one hand uh, shown the beauty of slim medieval women. On the other hand, it was a suggestion that such uh, corsets were used as a, um, a kind of torture for women, because it's another myth about uh, Middle Ages, that, uh, women who were too independent uh, were killed as witches. Of course, there were some examples of witch hunt uh, uh, in Europe and in United States, future in the United States, but um, they were uh, they usually took place in uh, both Catholics and Protestant uh, countries, and usually in 16th and 17th century, not in uh, Middle Ages. So the vision of Middle Ages as an as times of beautiful women and on the other hand witch hunts and um, tortures was very popular in the 19th century and probably that's a uh, time when those corset likes breastplates were metal breastplates were uh, created so uh, and especially ones like this that uh, look very uncomfortable and uh, uh, have nothing to do with natural uh, women's body shape. Uh, they are probably just fake ones put later in museums as um, examples of medievalism in uh, 19th century. So uh, that's an interpretation that we need to um, resign from and search for another uh, explanation of uh, the reason why such metal elements that look like a breastplate were used in Game of Thrones characters. Uh, another thought that uh, I had observing those uh, breastplates, breastplates uh, was um, the reminiscence of uh, parade armor. Parade armor is a category of armor used uh, not only in Middle Ages but also in early modern times and sometimes even in 19th century. Parade armor looked uh, had a similar shape to a regular one, but it was very uh, elegantly decorated. It could be actually used on a uh, um, in the, on the battlefield, but it's it wasn't their uh, main aim. Uh, they were, as the name suggests, parade armors uh, used uh, during some uh, events. Um, I like um, like just a costume. Uh, they could be worn on the battlefield. They usually uh, could protect the body from some minor attacks, uh, but no one used them in uh, that during battles because they were too precious, too expensive, uh, and there was absolutely no sense to use them uh, in a, on the battlefield. Uh, so uh, that's one of the reasons why they uh, usually survived until today. They were treated like, uh, just like uh, works of art, protected uh, and uh, sh displayed on um, in palaces and residences as any other kind of uh, work of art. They were uh, also given as a luxurious gift to uh, some guests or um, allies. Uh, and that's why they uh, are very often uh, shown on different 
in different museums and exhibitions uh, because, first of all, they are attractive. Second of all, they had a much bigger chance to survive until today than the ones that were actually used in, uh, on the battlefield. Uh, their decoration is usually very rich. Sometimes uh, you can observe their, uh, some gold, uh, precious stones. Uh, sometimes they, uh, their decoration uh, depicts some kind of uh, animals, uh, beasts, or something else, like this one. Uh, or a naked woman, because why not? Uh, they were extremely expensive, and this one was given as a gift uh, in Italy uh, from one... Um, ruler to another. Uh, yes, I thought I've had, I had one more example. So this kind of armor wasn't worn as a protection, but uh, as a kind of symbol uh, and um, suggesting that uh, the bearer has uh, uh, courage and he's a true warrior. Uh, he didn't have to prove his uh, um, uh, war abilities, but wearing this kind of armor was uh, a, a way to create an image of someone who is brave and who is a warrior. Uh, they, we can um, compare them to, uh, for example, very expensive and very luxurious uh, designer uh, sports shoes. They are not uh, adjusted to uh, some specific kind of sport. They can be used for running uh, or, I don't know, basketball, but there are more, there are models that are better adjusted to uh, some specific kinds of sport. But we uh, often wear this uh, designer sneakers uh, just to create an image that, of someone who is uh, active, who is uh, who likes sports, but they are too precious to use them for, I don't know, jogging in the uh, forest after uh, a rainy day. And it's similar as, uh, for example, with uh, very elegant and luxurious uh, SUVs that are also um, adjusted to uh, heavy terrain, but no rational owner takes a luxurious uh, uh, Porsche uh, for a trip uh, in the uh, woods when it can be damaged uh, and get dirty. Uh, it's just, uh, it was very similar with those parade armors. Another um, potential explanation of those armor-like elements uh, uh, in uh, women's, women's uh, dresses uh, are um, reference to Athena, uh, the uh, ancient Greek goddess of war, uh, and uh, to Minerva, the uh, Roman uh, goddess of war. Uh, Athena was uh, very often depicted uh, in this kind of chainmail, uh, like on this uh, example. Uh, sometimes we can see her in some medieval um, miniatures. This one on the right depicts um, one of the uh, very few uh, women who are said to have worn uh, actual armor. That is Jeanne d'Arc, uh, the French um, heroine uh, that uh, is said to have worn an armor in a, on the battlefield. Uh, this one that we can see here is, of course, a kind of parade, uh, um, ancient Rome-inspired one. Uh, but it's one of those two women that are uh, usually shown wearing a kind of armor uh, in medieval art. Uh, the armor of uh, Minerva uh, hardly ever uh, looked like something that could actually protect the body. Sometimes it looks like um, a very tight t-shirt uh, exposing body very directly and even not, not hiding the breast. Sometimes it looks like a combination of uh, t-shirt and uh, metal bra or something like this, like on the right. Sometimes uh, 
those breastplates were uh, very uh, richly decorated, like in those examples that we can see here. Uh, and of course, it's not a kind of armor that could protect anyone. It was just a symbol, a reminder that we we're uh, looking at the goddess of war, uh, who is supporting um, uh, supporting the army and uh, ruling uh, in a wise uh, way. Uh, sometimes uh, this kind of breastplate was also used, uh, a combination of breastplate and a metal corset was used uh, in uh, depictions of um, uh, virtues, uh, especially the, um, the virtue of courage uh, that was shown uh, with some elements of armor. Sometimes they looked like a bit similar to real armor, sometimes it was just a decorative element of um, a dress that seems to be made of metal, but it wasn't any kind of body protection. Uh, it became so popular that uh, some uh, elegant ladies and aristocrats in the 17th and 18th century uh, asked the painters to be depicted as uh, Minerva in this kind of corset breastplate. Of course, uh, they were completely imaginary ones, uh, created only by artists. They um, didn't actually wear anything similar. Uh, it was just a copy of uh, the dresses worn in those times, but uh, it looked like it was made of metal. And again, it couldn't protect the body anyway, because uh, the crucial parts that could be attacked were completely uh, uncovered, like in those two examples from 18th century. Uh, so, uh, yes, I'll come back to this uh, once again. And uh, the um, analysis of those um, examples of uh, feminine um, armor and body uh, breastplates and um, generally plate armor suggests that uh, that's more or less what uh, the authors of Game of Thrones costumes wanted to show. Uh, their aim wasn't to um, suggest that Cersei could actually um, fight wearing this uh, a bit absurd uh, corset-like armor, uh, but uh, it's rather a suggestion that uh, in the case of emergency, of uh, huge risk, uh, she chose this kind of dress uh, to encourage uh, uh, the citizens to support her and to show uh, that she's not, she's a warrior. She's uh, a brave woman who is not only an elegant queen, but also uh, a uh, true leader and warrior. So it was a kind of parade armor and at the same time um, a reference to Athena or Minerva, uh, the goddesses of war, uh, who were uh, supporting the army but not really fighting um, with them. So it's a suggestion that Cersei uh, was a kind of Minerva-like character uh, whose um, courage uh, was suggested by this uh, specific kind of dress. I think that's the most probable explanation of the use of such elements because the other um, examples of uh, the use of art in Game of Thrones suggest that it's uh, used very wisely and uh, it's all coherent. Uh, there are some more proofs that uh, I'd like to mention. Uh, this um, uh, photo caused a um, small scandal among the uh, Game of Thrones fans. It depicted one of the um, characters um, important in the uh, last and series and the one before the last. Uh, and we can see here a leather breastplate uh, that uh, exposes body very strongly and 
uh, which has a nipple. Nipple is very visible, uh, as you can see. It uh, caused, uh, I, as I said, a huge scandal because it was uh, uh, interpreted as a kind of uh, sexualization of the character, one of the uh, Viper's daughters, uh, a true warrior, a very brave woman who fought as uh, bravely as uh, men. So sh showing her in a um, corset-like breastplate with nipples was seen as a sexualization and um, objectification of a very strong woman. So uh, it was slightly changed in the um, final uh, scenes. Uh, uh, the creators of costumes explained that it was, um, uh, at first it was uh, made more visible and they tried to change it, that they noticed how it looks only after um, watching the um, the scenes and it wasn't their um, aim to sexualize those uh, characters, but uh, it was just a an coincident and a, a mistake and they are fully aware of the um, uh, consequences of uh, such image of a female warrior and so on and so on. But it's still, uh, it was still very broadly discussed by uh, the series fans, especially the uh, other characters, um, other Vipers daughters also wore this kind of breastplates exposing um, the body. Uh, we can see them also here, for example. There were copies, um, feminine versions of um, the leather, soft leather breastplate worn by their father, uh, which looked like a snail skin. Of course, but as you can see, this one didn't expose muscles, uh, breast, anything, while those ones really did. Uh, so uh, there was even a suggestion that uh, the Game of Thrones costume department is trolling George Martin. Uh, why trolling George Martin? Because the author uh, used several times the expression as useful as nipples on a knight's breastplate. Uh, it was a synonym of something completely useless, absurd, that uh, is a waste of material and time of um, uh, those breastplates creator. Uh, and uh, it was used by Cersei, by Tyrion, uh, by uh, Dolores Ed and other characters. And uh, the last quote uh, suggests that uh, George Martin used it also as a um, synonym of a completely useless, absurd and uh, funny kind of uh, armor. This last quote depicts a, a very uh, funny, uh, absurd, um, uh, armor that was a combination of uh, elements found in some, um, um, I don't know, I can't remember where, but it was a mixture of different elements that didn't uh, suit and uh, it was to depict the character as uh, a knight that looked a bit funny uh, with the mixture, mixture of a breastplate with uh, nipples and a pair, pair of uh, iron rings uh, put inside them and um, a helmet with uh, ram's horns, uh, which one of which was broken and uh, other elements of this funny armor were uh, decorated with flowers. So it was supposed to um, look funny and uh, not very serious. Uh, why George Martin thought about those nipples? Probably it was because of the nipple gate that arose uh, after um, the 1995 um, Batman movie. Uh, we can see here the bat suit that had um, 
very visible nipples on it. So uh, it was, uh, it caused a huge discussion. It was the biggest nipple gate ever. Uh, all the costumes had those elements uh, and it made many uh, movie fans uh, laugh at the costume designers. But in fact, it wasn't so stupid. It was mm, a reference to a very classical and elegant armor, especially um, uh, ancient ones. Uh, those two examples um, are from 5th and 6th century BC and were created in uh, Greece. Such plate, breastplates made of bronze were very popular in those times. Uh, and uh, as you can clearly see, uh, their, shape was the, their shape was a copy of uh, natural body shape. Uh, sometimes uh, um, looking at those, especially bigger ones, we can notice that it wasn't just uh, showing the natural um, body shape, but uh, rather creating it as um, as a push-up bra. Uh, there, uh, there are qu quite a lot of them survived until today, uh, and some of them were uh, clearly used in combat because they had they were destroyed or uh, they have been damaged. Uh, by another weapon. Of course, they were not worn um, directly on um, naked body, but uh, on some kind of um, shirt. Uh, but their aim was to uh, depict the uh, body shape in a very precise way. And of course, they all had nipples. Some of the, the examples look even more funny. This one uh, is from 5th century uh, and from southern Italy. Uh, because uh, it doesn't show the body shape, uh, muscles, uh, and anything, but it has nipples that look, um, to be honest, a bit funny. So clearly the bat suit was a reference to this kind of armor uh, that was also very popular in art. We can see it, for example, in these two examples, uh, two sculptures showing a clearly a uh, parade armor made of uh, leather, uh, which um, is created to copy the natural body, idealized body shape. Uh, those scenes were probably uh, added and made of metal. Um, they could be gold plated or uh, painted. And of course, this kind of armor wasn't used in combat. It was just for, uh, uh, parades and um, some official meetings. Uh, there were there are also quite a lot of examples from uh, 16th, 17th, and 18th century, like this one on the right, a very famous and uh, uh, perfectly made black uh, with gold um, breastplate and the whole armor. I'll come back to it later to. Um, so please remember those elements on the arms because I'll uh, mention them uh, again later. And we can even see how uh, those ornaments surround the nipples. Uh, uh, from uh, today's perspective, it looks a bit funny, but that was the fashion at, at, at this time. It was a reference to ancient armor, uh, as well as other elements that uh, we can see like this one here. Sometimes the armor didn't have, uh, uh, it wasn't shaped uh, as uh, muscles, but it had nipples anyway, like this one here. Uh, some of them use, looked like they were made of uh, very thin leather or even um, some delicate material that uh, covered the body and stuck, was stuck to them, to it. So uh, probably, uh, this kind of armor used in uh, by the plate was used in uh, Game of Thrones could be a reference to uh, ancient uh, armor, but uh, there is uh, one more interpretation uh, that uh, I think is also very probable. Uh, all those characters were uh, 
often depicted in kind of uh, corset-like uh, leather armor that didn't actually uh, protect a body because of uh, many holes and a very attractive look. Uh, they were also quite often wearing uh, delicate dresses made of uh, very soft silk-like uh, material uh, with some leather elements. Uh, it was light, it was very delicate and very feminine. Uh, probably the reason why it looks like this is uh, um, the general uh, depiction of Dorn, uh, this region of Seven Kingdoms uh, from which those characters were. Dorn was the southern part of um, uh, Seven Kingdoms and Westeros. Uh, it's uh, depicted as a uh, uh, very hot uh, and dry uh, region, uh, very far in the south. Uh, and uh, that's why, probably that's why uh, the uh, series creators uh, decided to use as um, a source of inspiration the architecture of uh, Muslim uh, countries uh, from 12th to 16th century. Uh, it's usually called, called Mudehar architecture. Uh, and the most uh, examples that survived until today are from uh, northern part of uh, Africa and especially uh, Spain. Uh, there are more, even more references to uh, these regions and to the Western vision of rich uh, East uh, like uh, the costumes worn by main characters, the rich silky gowns and um, uh, dresses, and also some uh, elements of uh, some pieces of furniture, for example, and especially the architecture of palaces. Uh, those scenes, uh, theoretically in Dorn, were, um, uh, were filmed in Alcazar of Seville, uh, one of the one of the uh, palaces that survived until today, uh, built in Muslim times, then redecorated in Christian times after fifteenth um, century, uh, and it was it's preserved in a perfect uh, condition. Uh, the characteristic elements that um, are very typical for Muslim architecture uh, from 15th and 16th century are, for example, uh, horseshoe arcs, arcs that we can see here, uh, and some specific kinds of decoration made usually of stucco. Uh, they are geometric, symmetrical ones. Here is an example of um, uh, those arches, uh, horseshoe arches that were uh, popularized in the 15th century. And until today, they are uh, very uh, important motive used in Muslim architecture. Uh, another um, reason why uh, there were the uh, Spanish uh, palaces from Muslim times used Muslim times used as a source of inspiration for uh, the Dorn Palace uh, is the uh, are those mentions uh, made by George Martin that. Uh, the palace in Dorn was famous for its gardens. Uh, it was especially surprising considering the uh, climate of this part of Westeros. It was very dry, um, very hot, uh, so the rich gardens uh, full of um, water elements were uh, strongly contrasting with uh, the uh, other parts of uh, the kingdom. Uh, such very rich, uh, beautiful gardens uh, survived in most of uh, those Muslim palaces in Spain. Uh, and they were famous also in the uh, medieval and early modern times uh, because the um, Muslim engineers uh, uh, popularized some very um, sophisticated uh, water systems that they learned um, uh, 
from uh, Byzantine ones. Uh, Muslim uh, army uh, conquered first uh, the, those parts of uh, Europe that were uh, formerly the part of um, Byzantine Empire, and then they continued their um, conquer, conquer uh, in northern uh, northern Africa, and then Spain and southern Italy. So they brought those um, sophisticated systems from uh, Byzantine Empire to southern Spain. Uh, that's why uh, their palaces were absolutely famous for their uh, water systems and uh, uh, beautiful plants. Uh, I'll come back to it later, just a few more examples from uh, Seville, like those arches and uh, stucco decorations. Uh, they are very precisely uh, done, usually they are sculpted, but some of them uh, were made using some um, uh, pre-designed patterns that were just copied thanks to stucco. Stucco is a um, mass that is very plastic and it's used for sculptures and some minor uh, elements like these ones. Uh, sometimes in the decorations uh, we can observe some uh, motifs inspired by uh, calligraphy. Uh, they're usually uh, just elements that look like letters but it's not any specific text. Uh, it's just a kind of decoration. We must uh, remember that um, Islam doesn't uh, accept any depictions of uh, animals or people, so the only decorations uh, that were allowed uh, are ones uh, uh, similar to some plants uh, or uh, just completely abstract ones. Here we can see the elements made of uh, stone, but most of them are made of stucco. A few more examples, those are from Seville. Uh, the lower part was created in Muslim times, the upper part in Christian times. Uh, another element that uh, brings uh, Muslim architecture to our minds uh, are those ceramic uh, elements. Uh, those are some more examples from Spanish uh, palaces. Uh, those are from 16th century, but it's a tradition that uh, um, was uh, the tradition from uh, uh, Muslim times. These are also from uh, Spanish palaces, but from Christian times, and a few more from uh, Muslim times. They're usually geometric ones, symmetrical, very complicated, and based on a uh, very precise mathematical design, geometrical design. A few more, we can also see here characteristic colors. Uh, it's dominated by blue and green with some elements in orange to contrast those uh, colors. Coming back to gardens, here are the gardens of um, Seville used in Game of Thrones too. Uh, water is very important in both uh, real uh, Muslim palaces and Dorn uh, palace. Uh, in uh, several palaces uh, that survived in uh, Spain, we can see those sophisticated systems of um, distributing water, uh, like this one that is alongside uh, stairs, and uh, some basins that were used to um, gather water after rain. It's something uh, also um, influenced by uh, the Byzantine architecture and used later in uh, Muslim palaces. Uh, sometimes water was also used to cool down the uh, palace, like in this example from Alhambra, uh, where water is just distributed um, in the whole palace and its floors uh, to um, help fight with um, uh, high temperatures. It's a very basic and ancient type of uh, air conditioning. And one more example from Alhambra, it's the generally fair part of the palace. Uh, so, if, uh, as we can see, uh, the costumes and uh, interiors of uh, Dorn palaces uh, were uh, influenced by uh, the Muslim uh, 
uh, ones. Uh, it's also a suggestion that the costumes of um, uh, those uh, characters uh, were um, influenced by the vision of uh, uh, Muslim countries and Middle East that was very popular in 19th century painting, art and literature. Uh, we are talking about uh, the Victorian, time, Victorian times uh, that were um, uh, a combination of um, modesty and uh, a desire to, to uh, learn something completely different. Uh, women wore uh, very long dresses that covered the whole body. Uh, prudence was very important for uh, the society. Uh, and uh, a very uh, a true woman was very modest and shy and uh, completely uninterested in any erotic aspects of the life. So um, a typical um, Victorian times man uh, dreamed of uh, some wild adventures outside Europe. Uh, that's, th those are the times when um, a specific myth of uh, uh, those Middle Eastern Muslim countries was created. Uh, of course, some contacts between Europe and uh, Middle East were uh, since Middle Ages. They were very uh, important, um, for example, in trade. Uh, but uh, it was 19th century where those contacts were most intensive. Um, and uh, the travelers uh, from uh, Europe so they're a completely different world. The world of uh, beautiful women who covered their whole body uh, when going outside, uh, but were completely naked and uh, or just wearing some delicate silk um, inside their homes. Uh, it was the world where uh, one man could have several wives waiting for uh, waiting for uh, him to just come and uh, choose them as their uh, favorite um, wife. Of course, it was uh, somehow derived from um, real uh, Middle East, but it was a myth, a, a fantasy about a completely different world that uh, didn't have the same limits, uh, limit, uh, social uh, uh, limits as uh, European countries. So we can see it in many uh, pictures from 19th century. Uh, they usually show uh, women bathing in um, all together in some very beautiful architecture, uh, dancing, listening to music, singing, or just taking some rests. This Turkish bath, so-called, were uh, also a very important part of this myth and fantasy about Middle East. Uh, it's uh, not surprising because when we think of those all those gentlemen living in uh, cold and uh, rainy uh, England, uh, their wives that uh, covered their whole body with uh, beautiful but uh, dark and uh, modest dresses, uh, the thought about beautiful uh, Middle Eastern uh, women. Uh, that didn't have those all those uh, religious uh, didn't have to obey those uh, European rules about nudity and uh, body. It was a very important fantasy for a European uh, men. And of course, many of those pictures uh, shown uh, beautiful slaves that could be just bought by uh, wealthy gentlemen. Uh, sometimes it was just an uh, opportunity to show a naked female body. We must remember that uh, nudity was a taboo in 19th century uh, society. So um, a depiction of a naked woman um, needed to be... Um, it couldn't be just an average ordinary woman shown naked. It had to be... Uh, some kind of ancient goddess, some um, a historic figure, or uh, like here, a slave sold by um, some traders. So uh, it was an opportunity to uh, depict a naked woman and to 
uh, for the buyers to buy themselves some uh, almost a pornographic uh, picture accepted uh, in the society. So it probably such images of beautiful bathing women influenced uh, the uh, costumes of um, those characters in uh, Game of Thrones. Yes, some more examples of this idealized vision. And coming back to the uh, armors uh, depicted in the uh, Game of Thrones series. Uh, I mentioned that uh, it's a series that is uh, very coherent in their style and uh, most of the decisions uh, um, about uh, dresses, costumes are um, very um, sophisticated and derived from some actual uh, tendencies that could be observed in um, medieval and early modern uh, uh, period in Europe. But we can notice there are some mistakes, but made, uh, in fact, not by uh, the creators of uh, the series, but, the, uh, but George Martin himself. Uh, a great example uh, are the plate armors used by um, some characters during uh, a combat. Uh, it's uh, especially this one uh, that was used by uh, the Knight of Flowers, as uh, he was called in the series. Mm, his plate armor was richly decorated with tiny flowers, and according to George Martin, he also used some uh, small stones uh, in the decoration of armor. Uh, it's beautiful, it's very light, as we can see. Uh, it's not covering the whole body. We can see it especially here near the um, spalder, the, the part that uh, covers uh, the arm. Uh, but the actual uh, armor used in such, um, during such events looked more or less like this. Uh, the a typical knight uh, had just one uh, set of uh, body plate. Uh, and uh, it was a universal one that could be used in different situations. Uh, if a, a knight could afford another set, uh, especially designed for those combats, it looked more or less like this. Uh, it, look, it covers the whole body. It's extremely heavy. Uh, and it couldn't be used in actual battle uh, because in battle uh, a knight needed uh, the whole view of the situation. He needed to be able to move, to observe what's going around, on around, uh, to move quickly according to the changes of situation on the uh, battlefield. Uh, once like this were to cover the whole body uh, during um, combat with uh, another uh, uh, another uh, person dressed in exactly the same way. The, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I missed the thought. Um, yes, uh, this one, as you can see, covers the whole body and uh, it was impossible to move. Uh, in such uh, plate, because the helmet was uh, stuck to the um, breastplate, uh, and um, the helmet itself uh, uh, couldn't move. The, it covered the whole uh, face, and uh, the face couldn't be uncovered. Uh, moreover, it had some elements that helped uh, to stabilize the weapon uh, during the combat, and. Uh, uh, the knight couldn't even move his hands because they were stuck in the same position. Uh, so it was uh, completely useless in the normal battle, uh, but it adjusted to the needs of uh, this specific part of tournament. Uh, some uh, tournament armors uh, even had uh, support for uh, uh, special support for um, the armor so that uh, the knight didn't even have to carry it in uh, his hand. They were very heavy, they were not decorated because decoration was completely useless. The main, main aim of this kind of armor was to protect the body as well as possible. Sometimes uh, they had some modest decoration, uh, but still the main 
aim was to protect the body, not to look well. That's why this kind of uh, very delicate, elegant uh, armor was would be completely useless in combat. It looks more or less like uh, those parade armors that I have shown you before. Yes, and coming back to those ones, uh, these are the um, armors of uh, Lannister family, uh, which are also very interesting and uh, derived from classical Roman ones. Some viewers uh, also connected it with um, Japanese armor because of those elements, but in fact they were uh, very popular in 17th century uh, European armor too. The main element that we can see here uh, is the lion's head used as a decoration uh, of all parts of um, the plate armor. Usually in, on the spolder, that's this cover of an arm, and on the breastplate uh, here. Uh, it was, of course, a reference to the um, coat of arms of Lannisters, which was uh, a lion. Uh, and we can see that, for example, Jamie Lannister wears this kind of armor instead of a general one uh, or a knight's guard uh, uh, one, uh, when he wants to um, uh, to show himself as a member of Lannister family, not a man of King's Guard. Uh, this kind of leg cover, a very light one that we can see here, and that looks a bit similar to Japanese one, uh, was a part of light armor used especially in the 17th century. Uh, it was much more, um, it was quite common because it was much more comfortable than the whole um, cover of the legs. It covered the upper part of legs uh, instead of uh, both uh, upper and lower part. Uh, but it was the most important uh, part of leg that was, uh, um, that could be harmed during the battle. And we can uh, see it in several different versions. Uh, I think that's the most uh, richly decorated one in the whole series with lions also depicted on the breastplate. Mm, this kind of uh, lion uh, heads elements we can see in many uh, real armors from 17th and 18th century. And there are some uh, written evidence of um, uh, use of this kind of armor in uh, ancient Rome. Uh, especially helmets with lion's heads, but also breastplates and uh, generally plates with uh, the motif of lion's head. This, that's the most famous one from uh, 17th century. And the one that I have shown you previously with a uh, kind of head that looks a bit, which is placed similarly to the lion's head uh, from the previous example. And one more picture. It's so beautiful that I just, uh, decided to put uh, in my presentation a bit too much photos of uh, this uh, specific one. Okay, I can see that I have only a quarter, so I'll switch to the later, uh, to the promised uh, examples of Art Deco in Mirin, because I think they're a bit more interesting than uh, the examples of uh, goblets used by the characters. Yes, sorry. Yes. Um, in the title of today's presentation, I mentioned uh, Art Deco in Mirin, uh, which was the other topic that I wanted to uh, talk about today. Um, Mirin is one of the slavers uh, by most important cities. Uh, and the most characteristic um, element of its architectures, architecture was where uh, uh, pyramids uh, that were used uh, as uh, a very um, huge palaces uh, of the slave owners. The shape of pyramid is uh, one of the most popular ones in our culture. And of course, it uh, brings to our minds usually Egypt and uh, uh, America. 
uh, especially from um, the pre-Columbus uh, uh, times. Uh, it's not a coincidence that uh, pyramids were used as a most important element of architecture of slave owners cities. Uh, there's a popular myth uh, that um, pyramids in Egypt were built by slaves. Uh, now we know, of course, that they were built by just regular workers who were uh, fed quite well, who were treated in case of some kind of injuries, and who just uh, were regular workers who got paid and who lived near the building uh, uh, site. Uh, but uh, the uh, connotation of uh, a slave uh, uh, society and uh, based on slave slaves' work and pyramids is still very strong. And probably that's why um, George Martin decided to uh, create uh, this kind of uh, palaces in Berlin and other slavers' uh, um, cities. Um, some um, there's of course the pyramids uh, are buildings uh, this kind of buildings that were popular in many other countries uh, and regions, uh, which is um, in fact quite a coincidence. It's not um, there's no um, straight connection between uh, the American ones and the Egyptian ones. Egyptian ones, because it's a quite obvious shape used in many cultures. But um, the American ones could also influence uh, the uh, architecture in Marine and other slave uh, cities, uh, as they were used um, to um, used as uh, also place where um, which was a symbol of oppression against. Um, poor people in the society and a very cruel uh, kind of uh, uh, society based on slaves' work and uh, um, cruelty towards uh, their own citizens. The Mayan uh, uh, pyramids are usually, um, they have steps uh, on all sides uh, that were used for uh, some religious uh, events uh, that took place uh, on them. So uh, the pyramids in Mirin are a combination of the Egyptian ones and uh, uh, the Mayan ones. Some uh, elements of the Mayan architecture we can also observe uh, in the, um, for example, near the throne, uh, on which we can see uh, already a new ruler um, uh, not the slave owners. Uh, and there are some tiny elements that are derived exactly from uh, the Mayan architecture, but it's not from the original Mayan architecture, as I will show you in a minute. Uh, just focus on those mm, uh, sculpted elements that we can see near the throne. Uh, a geometric decoration uh, here and here, I hope you can see it. Uh, there are some mm, designs in the Murin New Council Room and one more uh, design uh, of the same um, room that we've seen previously. Uh, note those elements that are on the left, uh, those geometric ones. And one more example, uh, note also the furniture that we can see here. And one more example as a proof that it's uh, quite a common uh, style of decoration in Mirin's um, uh, pyramids. Yes, I prepared a bit too many decorations. And uh, that's uh, the probable source of inspiration for those elements, because they are not derived directly from uh, Mayan architecture, but from Mayan revival architecture. It's uh, a style uh, popular in uh, especially United States in 1930s, and it was um, a type of Art Deco uh, style. Art Deco is was popular in 19 late 1920s and 1930s, and it was inspired by some more geometric uh, types of uh, Art Nouveau style. It was. Uh, 
quite popular, especially, as I mentioned, in the United States, but some uh, examples of this architecture we can observe even in Tokyo. Uh, this is uh, an imperial hotel in uh, Tokyo, uh, which was uh, damaged and rebuilt in completely new style uh, in the second half of the 20th century. And a few more examples um, from uh, the villas created uh, in the United States in 1930s. Uh, you can see here the symmetrical geometrical uh, decorations that cover the whole building and we can see similar ones inside like here or here. Very big windows, uh, some elements made of wood and a lot of uh, stone or concrete um, elements with those uh, characteristic decorations. One more example from the United States and this Mayan revival architecture. Yes, and uh, the source of inspiration for it. As you can see uh, in those um, Mayan revival architecture examples, it was uh, strongly simplified uh, and probably it was the exact source of inspiration of, for Game of Thrones. Uh, but uh, the connotations of uh, uh, Mayan architecture, Mayan society based on uh, slavery and uh, marine slaver city uh, was very strong and uh, it's a very good example of how uh, architecture could be used to um, direct our thoughts into uh, some connotations uh, because um, architecture is an abstract uh, kind of art. Uh, it's not like painting or sculpture that can um, sh depict, show us something just by um, some gestures of um, uh, sculpted um, characters or some other uh, tiny details. Uh, architecture uses our connotations, our uh, memories, uh, which help us to combine what we see with what we remember. Most of the Game of Thrones viewers probably know uh, pyramids. Uh, if not those Mayan ones, then surely they've seen uh, the um, Egyptian ones, at least uh, on photos. So um, the main thought that we have looking at pyramids uh, is the society based on slavery. Uh, and um, even though this connotation is not real because of, because as I have told you, uh, uh, pyramids were built by regular workers, not slaves, but still we um, connect those two uh, things, Egypt and slavery. So looking at uh, the architecture of Murin with huge pyramids uh, in which slave owners live, we uh, immediately think of uh, slavery, slave work, and uh, a society that is uh, um, that is um, based on some class distances. Uh, that's an idea that occurred in some other movies, literature, and um, a series, uh, like in, um, for example, Blade Runner, a classical Ridley Scott uh, movie in which uh, such elements uh, copied exactly from those um, the Mayan revival uh, houses were used. And there is one more um, similarity uh, because the uh, headquarters of the uh, main company that um, creates those androids uh, is shaped as a pyramid. Uh, those elements were used in several different uh, scenes. We can see it like here. Uh, and the idea of slave owners and uh, the richest class of the society that lives higher than the poor people is also very old. Uh, today we can observe it, for example, looking at the prices of flats. The higher, the more uh, expensive they are, but uh, it has some much deeper roots. The illustrations that you see uh, is from a very famous uh, early 20th century uh, movie uh, called Metropolis. It was uh, one of the most important and influential futuristic um, 
uh, movies of uh, old times, uh, it was uh, a depiction of um, a horrible society in which uh, poor people are deprived of any, um, uh, they have no money, they have no rights, uh, and they are forced to live uh, beneath the ground. Uh, they live like rats uh, under the uh, city. And the rich people live in very huge, tall buildings. Um, they are the only ones who can see uh, sunlight uh, during the day. Uh, in um, Blade Runner, we can observe very similar thought because, uh, in fact, the only scenes in which we can see the sun are the ones um, in this huge pyramid. Ordinary people who live uh, below uh, spend their whole lives in a complete darkness and just uh, electric light and nothing more. So um, the uh, um, the thought that uh, the richer, the higher, and uh, the um, idea of a city which uh, whose architecture uh, is a visual depiction of um, the society and its classes. It's very old and it was used here uh, in a very smart way, both in Game of Thrones, in which slaves live on the ground and the rich people, the slave owners, live in high pyramids, as well as uh, in uh, Blade Runner, in which modern slave owners, the creators of artificial slaves live in pyramids uh, while uh, ordinary people and the slaves that they were create that were created live uh, on the ground and just for the last three minutes of um, my lecture a few examples of uh, furniture in this art deco style uh, popular in 1930s usually they were made of wood um, uh, they had a very simple form with a lot of curves, but they were not uh, too, they didn't have too much decoration uh, like this ones. Uh, the main aim was to um, show the beauty of uh, uh, luxurious types of wood. Uh, sometimes it was a mixture, mixture of uh, uh, wood and uh, shiny metal. And we can see similar furniture in some scenes of Game of Thrones uh, series. I come back to that uh, in case you uh, didn't remember it. Yes, we can see it, for example, here. Those very characteristic chairs uh, with um, uh, elegant curvy line. And there was one more beautiful example, which I can't find now. So, yes. This um, table in the background, very simple, very min minimalistic, but um, made of beautiful wood with uh, elegant modest decoration. So it's surely um, not a coincidence uh, that the whole um, uh, interiors were designed in a very similar um, way. Uh, I think that's the most important aspect of the use of art in uh, Game of Thrones, because it's not only um, used as a source of inspiration, it's a part of the message that uh, the viewers get uh, because of those tiny details that we um, um, recognize, that we um, uh, can notice, usually not um, in a rational way. We just uh, connect those tiny elements with uh, some uh, of our memories, with some works of art that we uh, usually know, but not always, um, but we're not always uh, able to name them. So um, that's uh, one of the most smartest uh, ways of use art in um, pop culture. Uh, a very in-depth um, knowledge of uh, art of uh, 20th century, but the previous ones too, uh, helped the creators to um, the, help to create a very coherent um, 
uh, world in which um, each part of Seven Kingdoms, each part of this world has uh, its very specific style uh, based on uh, some elements derived from uh, European and uh, African Middle Eastern uh, architecture. Uh, in fact, uh, the style of uh, each part of Westeros is usually more coherent than, uh, for example, a copy of a medieval style in Viking series or um, uh, very popular uh, shows uh, that uh, uh, are so somehow connected with European history. Uh, I've, I've noticed um, less incoherences in, um, for example, King's Landing than in just one episode of um, Vikings series, which was uh, very inspiring, but uh, full of uh, smaller and bigger mistakes. So um, I would recommend each art lover to look at Game of Thrones as a great source of inspiration and how to uh, use and understand art, because the way it was used in the series uh, is also a suggestion on how to read architecture in general, uh, what the architecture can suggest us, what can be told by architecture and other uh, kinds of art. Okay, so I was supposed to finish two minutes ago. Thank you uh, very much for your attention. I've noticed that there are a few um, uh, viewers of my lecture. If you had any, uh, if you have any questions, I'm uh, happy to answer uh, all of them. Uh, if not, thank you very much for today, and I hope you enjoyed my um, lecture. Uh, and you remember something about Game of Thrones and not my uh, uh, mistakes and. Uh, any problems that might have occurred. So thank you very much. Okay, I see that the last participants left left the mist. The meeting, uh, so I'm going to finish it. Thank you very much. <laughs>